Welcome back, Holligans, to yet another Vamptober episode, the last one for October. Sorry this one's coming in kind of late. Uh, we had some technical difficulties. It happens. That's part of this part of this gig. No big deal. We finally are getting to the conclusion of our Blade series. And I say conclusion because we're not doing Blade 3. Nobody wants to hear about Blade 3. We're going to pretend Blade 3 didn't happen. This is Blade 2. Uh, now, I was one uh, to believe, by the way... My name is Joe, as always, joined by my co-host Ryan, here to kill it once again <laughs> in Movie Howl. But I, I was always of the belief that this is one of those rare movies where the sequel outshines the original. And I still think that after watching it again, I really enjoyed Blade 2. I think it's fun, good time, and does a good job of doing everything the first one did while improving on it without overdoing a lot of it now the first one being seeming to be a much darker movie this one had many more moments of levity uh you can tell wesley snipes is it's going to be hard to see anybody else in this role i believe uh they do have another blade movie coming out that they have uh, announced that but to see anybody else in this role is going to be difficult because he played it so well he he was blade so We'll have to see how it goes, but as we said in the first Blade review, Ryan had not seen these. So, curious, Ryan, how did you feel about Blade 2? Was I right? Was I wrong? Am I way off base? What do we What do we think? I think you're right about pretty much everything you said about it. I, I also agree with what you just said about it being hard to see anybody else in that role. Because I think, uh, like I think with Batman, there are a lot of people now, younger people who grew up only really knowing the Christian Bale Batman. So probably Ben Affleck Batman was a little hard to take. And Robert Battinson is going to be a little bit tough as well. <laughs> you know, it, it the Blade isn't a role that has had a long history like Batman has, where you had Adam West in the 60s, you had Michael Keaton in 89, and then, what was it? Michael Keaton, Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer. Yeah. And then George Clooney. George Clooney. And then Christian Bale, Ben Affleck, now Robert Pattinson. Mm -hmm. Like Batman is almost like Bond. Like certain actors get, you know, they get some time with the character mm -hmm. and then they hand it in, you know, for the next guy. So it would be real hard to find another blade to me from, in my opinion, because you're right, the way he played it, the way he physically embodies the character even. You know, the way he moves and the way he smiles and looks at things and stuff like it's it's so perfect. I can't imagine anybody else being able to do the same thing or even play the character without feeling like they're doing a cheap imitation. I I mean, yeah, I agree with that. But it's one of those like that being said, I think people would think that about other characters like Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. It's going to be hard, and there's going to be another one. They're going to do X-Men movies. They're going to do it. It's going to be hard to replace him as that character, but not impossible. Some people really like the Jack Nicholson Joker. Mm. People lost their minds over the Heath Ledger Joker and said there will never be a better Joker. And then we saw the Joker movie, which was at least as good as the Heath Ledger Joker, if not better, but in its own, it's a whole different thing than what you were trying to go for in the Batman movies with this Joker movie. So it's really going to depend on who they get, how it's done, any of that. But for me, I mean, I grew up with this early. This was Oh two for blade two. And so late nineties for blade one and, or even 2000, whatever it was just Wesley Snipes is blade. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to give whoever does it again a fair shake because it's all dependent. I mean, it's not just about the actor, whoever they get to come do it. It's also going to be dependent on the director, the story, what Blade storylines they take. And as far as I know, neither you nor I have ever read any Blade comics. We don't know any of the storyline with it. So, I mean, it's as long as they don't rehash what they've already done. That's what I just don't want to see. 
Yeah, you're right. You're right. We don't know the m- maybe the movie version wasn't that true to the comics. I don't know. And since we tried to do this before and I brought up Green Arrow there, I'll do it here, but in a different way. Because Arrow, a lot of people know Green Arrow through Arrow the show. And for the most part, like 98% of that, that's not really like him. At least not to the way he is in the comics. Or even like the cartoons. Okay. He's he's almost more Spider-Man than Batman, if that makes sense. Like he's, As far as like snarky and yeah, witty. Yeah, his attitude. Okay. Yeah, he's very not super serious about things. Um. But yeah, the rumor is that Arrow was originally written to be a Batman show. And then they kind of got nervous about making a Batman show. I mean, as they do, they they try to avoid putting Superman and Batman in stuff because they're the most um, like valuable characters that DC has. I mean, do they? They've had several Superman shows. They have. So I don't know if it's as true with Superman, but Batman, it's well, both Batman and Superman had the animated series ones. And mm-hmm. both of those were so good. Yeah, but I'm talking like live action stuff. Like they didn't want to add Batman to some extended universe on TV. And I'm glad they didn't. Like with how bad some of the other stuff has turned out and how bad the costumes have been. I don't want to see the CW Batman. I mean, they have but that girl, that woman. Sorry, that woman. Never. Different characters, not just the wrong term, but different characters. Yeah. <laughs> and that costume. I, I don't watch that show. But I've seen the costume and it it's looks real bad. It looks real bad. Real bad. I, I don't know what they did. Like, I don't know how they got it wrong, but that suit looks so bad. But so does the flashes in a lot of them. Mm. Um, I don't know. Anyway, so that all being said, yeah, I would like to see more Blade stuff. Hopefully they can do it justice. But as far as this specific movie, I do think it lived up to the original. But when we first talked about this, when we first tried to record it, I told you, it reminded me of like what I thought was the first episode of season four of Arrow, where he had just gotten with Felicity and he's no longer like in this vengeful sort of rut. He's like kind of happy. Okay. And he's fighting crime and doing stuff and it feels like he's enjoying himself. And that's how Blade feels at the beginning of this movie, which was a little jarring and a little worrying to me since I had just seen the original so shortly before. You know, I didn't have like the four year gap or whatever it was between the original and the new one coming out. Yeah. You know, as though I was seeing them in theaters, but it added a lot to it. It made them a lot more human, made them a lot more relatable, made them a lot more interesting to watch since he carried a lot more of the movie on his own instead of having the the doctor from the first one. I can't think of her name. Karen. Yeah. The one that we experienced the story through because mm-hmm. he comes in and brings her along because she's been into all this stuff and whatever. So now, like, he's truly the main character. He's the one that we're following. He's the one that we're experiencing everything through. And I think they had to do a lot of what they did with the way he behaved. But I really enjoyed a lot of it. A lot of it added to how fun it was and kind of striking that balance between serious and just fun action movie. You know, moments like where he has that vampire at the beginning, the ridiculous one. Who's got the long hair, big bald spot, pink boa. He's trying to ride a motorcycle to get away. And Blade lets him go. And then they encounter each other later. And when those two meet up again, they're in a club in Europe, wherever they're supposed to be. And Blade almost bumps into the guy. Or I think does bump him with his shoulder. And the vampire turns around and goes to say something to him, then realizes who it is and runs away. And as he does, Blade just like gets Mm -hmm. it across like half his face i i really appreciated the added personality with him and that they m- explored the relationship between him and whistler a little bit more i don't know that i loved mm-hmm. brought whistler back since his end seemed pretty pretty heavy and pretty conclusive at the end of the first one what do you think about it what do you think of them having brought him back we didn't really talk about it before yeah um i will be honest when I watched this movie the first time. I was pretty surprised that they retconned him back in there like that. But, and I mean, he's pretty, pretty handy with the tools of the trade. Like he's not a stranger to firearms, things like that. And, you know, you hear stories about people who try to do that. You know, they're going to like shoot themselves, but they miss and it, they don't end up killing themselves because of a mistake. He doesn't seem like the kind of individual 
who would make that mistake, but anything's possible, I guess. And having him back for this movie just added to the story of this movie. It was really nice when this movie starts back up that it picks up right where Blade 1 leaves off. And I like that. I like when sequels do that, when it's when it's the right thing to do. And this was one of those movies where it was. It was the right choice to make to pick up exactly where original Blade left off. He's in somewhere in Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Russia, and something's he's he's searching and you don't know in the beginning that he's searching for Whistler except for there's this bit of dialogue that Blade has as the credits roll and he he starts talking to you about everything that's going on and what kind of just a synopsis for anybody who didn't see the first movie kind of a thing like when you read series of books and if you read you know, Harry Potter 2, 3, 4, whatever. In those, there's going to be a little bit of background information just in case for the people who haven't read those previous books and this is the one that they happen to get. That's just a general, you know, unsurprising thing that they do. And not my favorite, the way they started that with him and just talking and expunging information that way. But it was short, to the point, and then the movie just gets rolling. And my favorite thing about this movie compared to the first one is the antagonist. In the first one, you have Deacon Frost and interesting back and forth between in the vampire nation, the it's almost like the haves and the have nots, the uh, pure bloods versus just the turned. And there's a, it's a big deal. They do reference it a couple of times in blade two that uh, some of the, the pack that he joins up with that there's a little bit of reference for that, but it's not, that's not what the movie revolves around. Unlike the first one, but the first one, Deacon Frost, he just, he just wants to take over the world. It's a super basic. I'm evil. And I'm, we need to be above all the humans, which that's not an unfair thing to think that's humans. Uh, we evolved past the Neanderthals. And so Homo sapiens pretty much wiped all of them out because that's how evolution and throughout history, that's how that works. And so they see themselves as that step. Like if there were mutants and that was a real thing, humans are boned. We're done. We're done. So that's just, and that's, if it's part of the natural order of evolution, if that's just the way things are going to happen. I mean, you don't have to like go out of your way, like genocide type of wiping everybody out the way he wanted to, but eventually you, you all win. That's how that works. This villain quote unquote was just, it's just all around better. He's understandable. You, I mean, he's a villain, but he's like, he was a created villain and what happened to him wasn't necessarily his fault. He's just dealing with the situation he's been put into. And uh, just, I liked him. Uh, Nomak, this character of Nomak, you see him from the very beginning and you're not really, they, they keep how these, the Reapers is what they're called. They kind of keep it under wraps for a little while, how they look, what they do. And I like that. I like not knowing right away. Like, don't spoil it. Hold something back. It's all right. And the story was more compelling this time. It was more than just Blades World and him doing what he does in the world. There was, there was so much more to it. He has to, he gets recruited by the vampire nation because, and they don't really put it this way, but because they screwed up and created these things and now they have to deal with them because they're so much worse. The vampires, they just are full on monstrous. Like Nomak has a brain and a conscience and like he can determine right, wrong. Like he still is a thoughtful being. The other ones, they're just, mindless feeding machines there's no real you know there's no there's nothing behind them it's just it's just the hunger that's all it is for them and they produce really quickly they're stronger and more powerful than the vampires and overall that would become a problem so you know the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of a thing which does that line gets brought up in here it's something that makes sense 
But one of the things that makes it really fun is when they go to recruit Blade and he gets introduced to this team he's going to be on. Well, this team is a team that's been training for two years to hunt him, which it's not like they just threw some people together. All right, we have Blade and now we have you guys and you're all going to go and you're going to go do this thing. It It's more complex than that, that he's forced to work with or they're forced to work with him because, him. you know, head, right. Head vampire guys like you're going to do this. It would be literally the last thing they would want to do. And so that makes it a little bit more complex. Uh, I really liked the writing in this one. It was well done, the idea and thought that was put behind it. And as I said, or as we had mentioned, no idea if these are actual storylines out of the Blade comic. But regardless, this was fun. And those are some of the reasons why. The, the story was more compelling. The characters were compelling. I mean, you've got not only Wesley Snipes in it, you have, uh, oh, oh my gosh, Ron Perlman, mm -hmm. who is working in this movie for what we think is the first time with Guillermo del Toro, uh, who directed Blade 2, which I didn't know until I watched it this time. And he ends up going on to be Hellboy 1 and 2, which there should have been a third one of those, but that's a whole separate thing. The other one that we got, I haven't watched it yet, so I don't want to make any commentary on it. And then you have Donnie Yen who was great. And I happened to watch, uh, it just popped up on my YouTube feed. Apparently, uh, Stuckman, he did a review of blade two for this season's Halloween thing. Hmm. And so I, I watched that and he made a good point of how much fun would it have been to watch Donnie Yen face blade like that yeah. fight. Like that was maybe a missed opportunity. I don't think they used him as well as they could have. And like we mentioned before, it's something he didn't mention, uh, in his review is how disappointing the ending was for that character. So he was one of the blood pack who Blade is, you know, gets teamed up with. And I, I he's great. Mm -hmm. They all have their own little personalities. There are all these different characters from all these different backgrounds. And yet nothing, it doesn't feel like some of the movies today, like you had mentioned in the original time we recorded, you're not just checking boxes. We have a this, we have a that, we have this thing over here. It's just characters that got brought together for the storyline. And they all fit and it's all fun. And that's what this should be. I think Hollywood forgets that. That we go to watch these movies because they're entertaining. And if you're not making something that's entertaining, what's the point? Yeah. It's something that struck me as you were talking was the idea of how who's the bad guy or who's the monster depends on your perspective. Like they set this squad up to kill Nomak. And these new monsters because they're the best and they're the best because they've been training to kill the monster. The vampires are worried about, which is blade. Mm -hmm. Like from our perspective in the first movie, the vampires are like barely civilized. They're having like eyes wide shut parties and stuff like that. And eating people uh -huh. and spraying blood out of sprinklers and all this. And they see blade as the monster. And then in this one, we get a glimpse of kind of a more civilized vampire society where they're actually like buying blood, basically. Like they're not killing people. They have other ways of doing it. They have other ways of sustaining themselves and getting by and going undetected. And there's something worse that infiltrates them and they have to call in their monster. And I really, I mean, it's almost like, um, I think it happened in Dragon Ball Super. Like they bring in Frieza or like older villains to like help with a fight. It's kind of like that a little bit. Okay. You bring in like the big bad from the last movie to face the one from this movie. Or <laughs> or like uh, Jurassic World where you have the Indominus Rex versus the T-Rex, which was the big bad from the original movies. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's certainly not a new concept doing that. No, but I had something worse it. comes along that you team up with your enemy so that you can take it out. That's not necessarily a new concept. But the way they went about writing it for this was well done. The characters were fleshed out. They, yeah, the interactions were fun. Ron Perlman wears those sunglasses through the entire movie. He mm. never takes them off. So if you watch, all, he's, ne he's never without whatever those sunglasses that he's got on, which was kind of a, a fun little thing. Yeah. And it's just something I hadn't noticed that it's a matter of perspective like that, that it's, well, these are our monster monster hunters. They were trained to fight you and they see him as a monster, not just a rival or whatever. Like you are 
the biggest threat to us. And I guess it hadn't hit me quite that way until you said it. Yeah, because, you know, me and the boys were just wondering, can you blush? Yeah, strange line. But, yeah, like we talked about the first time we discussed this movie, I like that line that they brought it back. I like that they had a ice skating uphill line at the end. But this time it made sense. It's something that's being called back from the first, I don't know, half of the movie, maybe Mm -hmm. first third of the movie. Yeah, one of the things that, and we got to talk about it the first time we tried to do this, is in one of our earlier reviews, I referenced something out of Blade 2, but you hadn't seen this movie, which is, I think, when I found out you hadn't seen any of these movies. In Gemini Man, there's a scene towards the end where this, it's a CGI thing, where this character like does these leaps up a building or something, and it's really, just doesn't look good for the time that this, you know, Gemini Man came out a couple of years ago, and... In this, there's a scene when, pretty early on, uh, you have met uh, Whistler Comes Back, you have met Scud, which is Blade's new tech guy, uh, played by uh, the dude from Walking Dead, and I know I named him before. Oh, I can't think of it. That's so lame. Such a unique name, too. Damn it. Norman Reedus. Yes, Reedus. So, and young, super young for him in this. He's like a kid, and it, it works well for this. But in that scene, the a couple of ninja vampire guys come, and they start fighting with Blade, and there's, there's some things they do, some CGI, some moving, hopping around, some different things that looked very similar to what went on in Gemini, man. But, you know, this is a 20-year-old movie. So you can look at that and be like, oh, yeah, that's 20-year-old CGI that doesn't look terrible, and a some of the stuff in this still holds up and looks really well. Yeah, like I agree with the, that. When the a vampires of- get killed and they like burst into ash, uh, like just disintegrate, and it's like they're burning, but almost from the inside out, and it just lo- still looks good. You know, to this day, they did a good job with that. They did. There's a lot of CG that looks passable, and I bet it would be hidden more if we were watching this on VHS and uh tube tv like it would have come out on on video originally it's true or, well it would have been dvd and vhs back then but yeah i bet a lot of it would have been hidden by that so you never would have noticed unless you watched it in hd like we did and a lot of it they still stick with practical effects when we talk about things that hold up really well it's the stuff that you do practically in this a lot of that relates to like the makeup and the costumes and things like that the way mm-hmm. the new uh, Reapers look, their the way their mouths look, the way their teeth look, the way everything moves, like a lot of that is clearly practical, and it looks really good. It looks really real, and it looks scary, like genuinely scary. And I appreciate that they took the time to do that. You know that it's not like yeah, this is a a good vampire movie with the thought of it's bloody and it's gory, like there is there's some stuff in this some. You know, stuff getting sliced open. There's an autopsy scene, and there's mm-hmm. just some some really gory, well done stuff. It was a good one to pick for an October kind of a thing. It's not yeah super scary, but there's a couple of moments. Uh, the that creature unimpaling itself as yeah. it crawls back up to the ceiling. It was that I don't I don't need to watch that over and over again. It was the gross and creepy and not cool. So yeah. They did a good job. You can. You know, if they make you feel that way, I think that's how you're supposed to feel when you see that. Exactly. They did really, really well with the practical effects. And I, again, I think the CG, it was not overused. I know it wasn't that available to them, but I just really appreciate it. I appreciate when they don't rely a lot on it because it's something you've said before, like it's never going to look good in the future. CG is always going to move forward. So your stuff is never going to age well if it relies really heavily on CG. Mm -hmm. so the fact that they use so much practical especially for the monsters is commendable i will mention one thing that i just thought of which is that the familiars something they established in the first movie that they don't go out of their way to explain in this but the familiars have some kind of like egyptian marking on their skin somewhere yeah marks them as the property of one of these vampires or like the familiar of a vampire or whatever and one of them has the wakanda one really it's in their lip Oh, that was uh Yeah, I don't want that in the podcast, but yeah. 
And he did, and they did it before Wakanda. They did indeed. I don't know. I don't know if those are from the comics. I don't know which of those came first. I think Black Panther's been around like 50 years, so probably them. But it was just something funny to see that I forgot about the first time we talked about this, and I just remembered for whatever reason <laughs> that that happens. So one thing I, I thought about in this, uh, I didn't mention it the last time we did this, but I think it's worth mentioning. So this blood pack, who's been training for two years to hunt Blade, now they're teaming up for the purpose of stopping these Reapers. But as soon as that is over, you're back to being enemies again. It's not like you're just going to, all right, well, I'm going to go my way. You guys go your way. Have a great one. Off into the sunset. No, no. You're back to being enemies again. So I thought it was a really interesting decision when uh, Blade starts talking their first get together. He's like, we're going to have to go to your safe houses, your blood banks, your party areas, all this stuff. We're going to have to go your clubs. We're going to have to go check all that out. And... She, uh, the head vampire S, the daughter of Damaskinos, the leader. Nissa. Right, Nissa. She she takes him, takes all of them, but he's like, I don't see any markings. And she she's like, here, look through these. Like, you don't have to do that. You can just be like, trust me, it is. Yeah. Like, that's, I don't know why you would give up that information because he's still your enemy. Like, he's not, you don't need to, Give him all of your trade secrets just because you ha- you're you forced to team up to combat this other evil. Just how about I show you where some places are? We'll move them later, but we're not going to show you how we know this is the place. Yeah, how Dang. we've how we've been marking them and hiding them from you lately. Right. Like they developed but that clearly because like- of him <laughs> and then they show him how they did it. Right. She was all proud to do it. Hey, check this out. We outsmarted you. Ha 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 ha. Oh, well, uh, that's over with. Thanks for that information. Yeah. So I thought that was not the best choice. It might have been better to just say, trust me, it is. Like, th- that would have made more sense for it. But otherwise, there's not a whole lot to nitpick in this movie. There's some a few campy things. And as it's going to be for a movie that comes out in 2002, just overall, the story is better. The characters are fleshed out i just like pretty much everything about this i like the the fight scenes are well done some of the cuts might be a little bit different from the original but i still think it was cut up well i thought it was done well you had donnie yen in this but he was also the fight choreographer and in this one one of my favorite parts about it is there's this build-up to the end showdown and this, you know, so many movies build up to that where you've got the hero versus the villain and you've got blade versus no Mac in the final fight. And blade kind of gets his ass kicked. Like it, it does a good job of showing, even though, you know, blade is blade and he's a badass and he's been killing vampires for years at this point. He kind of gets handed to him a little bit by no Mac because that's just how much more powerful they are. And I still like the way everything played out. Uh, I know you had mentioned before that you had kind of called what was going to happen mm. with Nomak just because on just based on his personality. And, th- and I think that makes sense uh, that you thought that's the way it was going to play out. And I think you are right with that. It, it works for the character because he wasn't evil just to be evil. No, he, he was wasn't a tragic mustache. Yeah, right. He, yeah, wasn't... he wasn't twirly mustache evil. He was, just put in a terrible situation and just had to deal with it. Yeah. Like Frankenstein's monster. Mm -hmm. Same sort of thing where it's like, he wants revenge for being made the way he is basically like his, his monstrous condition is a vehicle for his revenge and it's like a tool for it. So yeah, it, it was, I called what would happen to him ultimately, but the way they did it still surprised me. Like it's something I called from like, 40 minutes in or whenever you first see him, like the first couple scenes with him. And then, yeah, it still surprised me. And I think that's another testament to how well this movie is made and how well it's written, that the villains are so good. The villains are very compelling. They, there are more than one and they all have different motives and the different motives don't necessarily go directly at odds with each other, but they don't necessarily work together either. They kind of result in interesting situations that you might not expect. 
And that for me, I definitely didn't expect because everybody has something they're trying to do. The main ancient vampire wearing like the 14th century Italian clothes, Demoskinos, <laughs> I think you said. Yeah. Yeah. He is fleshed out. He has his own motives. There's stuff going on with him that we don't know about. And it's like we talked about in the last one, like everybody has some story that we don't have to know every little bit of, and it makes them feel real that they're all different. They're all doing different things. They act different. They dress different. They fight different. You know, they're not just carbon copies of each other for the sake of padding the number of characters in the movie or the runtime. Yeah. I really like how all of the characters or at least some of the characters played off of each other. Uh, Wesley Snipes and Ron Perlman playing off of each other. That was fun. Uh, Norman Reedus as Scud, the way he played off some of the other characters. I was really, I mean, even though they retconned it and did it, I mean, it made sense for this story and I liked having him back, but I was just glad to have Chris Christopherson back as the character of Whistler because I liked that character. Yeah. And so it was fun to see him back as that. You had Nyssa who played a good character and there was no, man, it just, it was really nice to just watch a movie that was fun, had good characters, doesn't feel like it's just checking boxes to check boxes so that you can get the most, you know, points for whatever group you're trying to pander to. You're like, no, we're just want to make a fun comic book vampire movie. And you can tell in this movie, Blade, uh, this movie Blade 2, that Wesley Snipes is having fun. Like there's just yeah. thing you can tell. He enjoys that character as well. He should. He does a good job with it. Like he, some characters, it's just, you're, you're that character. Like this is like Ryan Reynolds and Deadpool. Nobody else, <laughs> he was meant to be Deadpool. Nobody else is going to play that character. Nobody else is going to do it like he, so Blade, he, Wesley Snipes was meant to be Blade. And as I said, open mind about whatever they come up with, whatever comes next. Um, I look forward to it. I like checking stuff like that out, but it's going to be, ooh, it's going to be hard to top that when he almost runs the motorcycle into the car and just leans over, give a little smooch, a little smoocheroo. Yeah. Just small things like that that are just, just made Perfect. it fun. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the glowing praise I have. How about you? I know there's more I could talk about with this movie, but that pretty much covers it. It's, if you have not seen Blade 2, it's worth a watch just all the way around. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of CGI things that are a little meh, but for the most part, it holds up as far as special effects and things like that go. And the story's really well done. It is written well. It's directed well. The actors really nail their parts. Everybody feels like somebody who matters and nobody's just there to, you know, oh, I'm, I'm here as a just comic relief. I'm here for just expunging this information to the viewer. I'm the it's guy in the chair. Hmm? I'm the guy in the chair. Yeah. The guy like in, in Spider-Man, right? When Ned says that or whatever his name is, he's like, I'm the guy in the chair. You know, in all the movies, there's the guy in the chair. It's, <laughs> I mean, it kind of has that, but they're capable of more than that because they portray them like real people. Yeah. There is no, just the guy in the chair. That's nice. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that from the newer of the Spider-Man movies recently. Mm -hmm. That's good. And it was fun that he would, that they would write that line in there. Because, I mean, they put it in because they know what they're doing. They know why they're putting it in there. So that was being self-aware like that. In this movie, I think, had a little bit more self-awareness to it than the original did. As we said, the original was much more serious, much darker in tone. And this being a little bit lighter, yet still having some... The storyline was heftier. More The stakes were higher. And you felt more compassion for some of the characters than you did in the first one. So well done by them with blade two. And I think it might've been harder to take if it was as dark and serious as the first one, because it's so much more terrifying than the first one. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just something that they realized would make it more palatable. Maybe. I mean, interesting thought. Maybe what would it have been like? Had they gone darker with it? And that could have been a thing too. Because the world of Blade that he lives in, that's a dark world. You know, the what did what did he say in the first movie? The world you you see is a candy coated topping. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> to what is really going on. But no, this was uh well, all we can say is it's gonna be a watch for me. That's all I know. Definitely a watch for me as well. 
So I think that's it. So if you guys would like to reach out to us to tell us what you'd like to hear next, we are going to be trying some new stuff in the next few weeks, few episodes. So if you want to make suggestions or send in comments or tell me that my post cold voice sounded terrible during this, you can do that. Our email address is moviehow at gmail.com and you can find us on Twitter at moviehow. Yep. Thanks as always, Holligans, for listening. Hope you did enjoy it. Uh, if this was enough to make you watch the movie and you'd never seen it before, let us know what you thought about it when after you do. Were we right on? Were we off base? Let us know. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Ryan. And we are out. Do you think I forgot about you? <laughs>